Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here for an episode of Ohio X Live. Uh, today, we're talking about the future of work. We're joined by uh, a really good group of panelists and, and folks that are leaders in their fields, um, all with really interesting backgrounds and perspectives as we uh, have a nice conversation around something that's really top of mind for all of us as we're navigating uh, coronavirus and this new world that we're in, which is uh, very much, uh, you know, unique and, and no one in, at least in our lifetimes have, uh, have experienced this or at least uh, none of us, um, a kind of a global pandemic, which has really reinforced or, or made us force us to uh, uh, have, you know, conversations about what work looks like, both now uh, and then in the future, both in the short term and long term. So I, as we're beginning, uh, thank you for everyone who's attending today. Uh, we're really excited about this. Um, we're joined today by three fantastic uh, professionals. Uh, Scott Allen, the first one. If Scott, you want to maybe raise your hand a bit. Scott is a professor at John Carroll University, a uh, business professor in addition to some of his coursework that he teaches. He teaches a really interesting course on the future of work. So this is right up his alley and how emerging technologies uh, intersect with one another. We have Carrie Murphy. Carrie is a senior director at Venture for America. Venture for America is a nonprofit organization that puts young professionals, recent college grads from really good institutions all over the country uh, into startups, into technology companies, in places like Cleveland, Columbus, Cincinnati, and others. So Carrie is a leader at Venture for America, uh, sees exactly you know, uh, young technology companies and then also the talent that help make them grow. Uh, and then finally, Mike Walker. Mike is a senior director at Microsoft. Uh, Mike, I'm sure, is going to have a ton of interesting perspective on this because he works for big tech uh, and he also lives in Ohio and he has for some time now. So uh, he's experiencing what a lot of us are already, uh, or he, is ex he has experienced what a lot of us are now experiencing for the first time and certainly the opportunity that Ohio has um, in, in recruiting talent from the coast. So before we begin, um, Ohio X Live, we hope this is a good mix of Meet the Press and a sports talk show uh, where we can have a good conversation around interesting topics, uh, and it's not your kind of typical boring webinar. Uh, we want it to be entertaining, educational, and informative, uh, and as a uh, stand, you know, not so much a standard event where we're going to talk for 40 minutes and then open it up to Q&A. If you have questions, there's a chat bar. Uh, please insert it as we're having this conversation, and we're happy to uh, insert your perspective, your thought, your question into the conversation. Uh, so just send it in there and it can go to the entire group or me as a DM personally, uh, whichever you prefer. Uh, so, but as we begin, so we're talking the future of work, uh, a big topic made bigger by coronavirus. And today we want it to be an open conversation on what that means, both before the current reality we're living in, uh, during what we're experiencing now and then the future and the months and years to come and how that's going to shape. Uh, there's a whole list of companies that are making really big changes. Everything right here in, in Ohio from Nationwide Insurance, which is uh, taking a lot of their physical office space and, and, and moving it simply to a couple big hubs and allowing people to work remotely, which is a big shift for, for a very large Ohio company. And then certainly things like Twitter, Square, Box, Facebook, they've all had um, really big announcements recently. And so as we begin this conversation, uh, we'll start with something that's timely. Mark Zuckerberg this morning was on CNBC and he was talking about how Facebook is making this shift themselves. And they're certainly a leading technology company he said as much as 50% of Facebook employees in their workforce could be re working remotely in the next five to 10 years. Uh, and he says at the moment, because of this pandemic, 95% of their employees are at home and working. And he says, one of the top reasons when people leave the company, they tell us that they are leaving us because they want, us, they want to move to a place, maybe be with their family, but they don't have a physical office at that location. So if we think about it, a really big, one of the top tech, top companies period in the country to work for um, has that same challenge and those same issues. So as we open this up and we'll start, Mike, how about we go to you first, where you have, you're experiencing, uh, or you have experienced what we all now are, and that you work for Microsoft and you've worked in big tech and you've seen all over the world, but you do it, uh, your home base is, is in Northeastern Ohio and you work from home. Uh, so let, let's start with your perspective and, and what this means as someone who's already been in the place a little bit. Yeah, uh, happy to. And uh, thanks, Chris, uh, firstly, for uh, inviting me on here. And second, I love the uh, the rocking of the mustache there. Um, so, so yeah, so 
here's the thing. I mean, we've got, you know, Microsoft, you know, we're, you know, the number one company on the planet based on market capitalization. We've got 160,000 people around the globe and has been majorly disrupted by this global pandemic. And while there have been some of us that have been remote based, so I've, I've been a remote employee, whether it was my time at Gartner or my time here at Microsoft, you know, I've been a remote worker for a decade now. And this feels very different, even as a remote worker. And it's something that if you ask other remote workers, they'll, they'll say the same to you as well. And, and really what it's about, there's more psychology behind this than anything else. It's the notion that one, you know, what we find, we did a major sur survey inside of our company and we, and we found that people are working more than ever. The work-life balance has been significantly disrupted. Um, I've got, you know, way more meetings on my calendar than I ever have before uh, as a remote worker. And whether that's people want to prove they're not playing Xbox all day, or it's a case of uh, they're just wildly more productive. That may be the case. Um, but what we're finding is that we are more productive. But that doesn't come without consequence, though. You've already heard about Zoom fatigue. Well, there's very real reasons why there is Zoom fatigue. It's human beings weren't meant to stare at a camera like I'm staring at right now. Uh, and in a, in, in a physical room where there's people around you, you don't have to have that level of acute awareness. And so we are adapting in very, very interesting ways. And so as, as a big tech company where, you know, we were founded in the late 70s, we still kind of have some of those traditional values of, hey, being on site in Redmond, Washington is essential to be part of the decision making process. Well, up until pre-pandemic, that was the case. I was in Redmond, even though I was remote, I was in Redmond at least once a month uh, with you know, my team, uh, different executives, et cetera. That is slowly eroding. And what you're gonna find, not only from what we're seeing, but what McKinsey is seeing, what Gartner is seeing, what other companies are seeing, is that people like myself that have enjoyed the luxury of rolling out of bed and not dealing with an hour commute and you know, being distracted at water coolers, et cetera, People are going to demand this style of work. And so there's a lot more we're going to cover, but those are some initial observations and some impacts from a big tech company. And we're not the only ones. Twitter has announced, you know, uh, people have the option to stay home if they want, you know, full stop. Uh, Amazon has done similar things and we have done similar things as well. And the last thing I'll leave us with, and I'll hand it off to some of my esteemed uh, panelists here, is we're rethinking how we interact physically as well. So when you go into a Microsoft building going forward, you won't have your, your Microsoft badge and badge in, but contactless where we're using facial recognition right when you walk up to the door, read your face and then automatically opens it. You don't have to touch a thing, right? And so lots of interesting developments that are happening. And Carrie, you um, I'm sure have an interesting perspective from previous work and then now what you do because you were in New York City. Uh, and you worked in helping place professionals at places like Goldman Sachs and others, which, you know, to be, uh, as, as Mike was describing, uh, you know, to be in the decision making of Microsoft, you have to be an HQ. Well, that's very similar to being on Wall Street in the financial district in New York City. Um, but now you're working with startups and you work remote on a remote team all across the country. So what's the perspective that, that um, you're seeing having that experience in big co uh, financial services, but now working with tech companies that are very nimble and, and, and you work from home yourself. Yeah. So, you know, we, I work, our entire organization is remote. Um, we have about half of us um, are all based in different cities. And so for myself personally, this change of everyone staying home hasn't been that drastic from like a normal work. I, a lot of my times I am out meeting people in person, but obviously not doing that. I think the biggest change has been, it was nice not having to overcome hurdles of how to do my job remote. Um, but the biggest change obviously was just the, having your child home and not having daycare support. And that's something I think a lot of people, you know, for a lot of companies, particularly bigger companies, I've also worked at startups where having previously been in the role of, of a recruiter, um, trying to get buy-in that remote, building a remote culture is a great way for us to be able to attract and retain talent and get 
more diverse talent and talent from a larger pool. Um, and I think now companies are maybe skeptical of remote work and like can employees be productive and still get everything done. And I think this is an opportunity that is showing a lot of businesses. Yes, actually your employees can get a lot done. They can get probably more done than they were getting done in the office. Um, you can also save money because rent's in incredibly expensive and there's other costs. You know, people are not having to do their commutes and spend as much money on gas or, or whatever it might be. Um, but then there's going to have to be a learning curve to understand how do you build remote cultures and make sure that your employees don't get burnt out and they are able to know when to shut off work, um, when to spend time with your family and kind of find that balance. So I think there's it's the the um, openness and willingness to consider remote work has dramatically changed um, but i think now there's still going to be this learning curve of like what does that look like and how do we make that something that is beneficial to our employees because right now a lot of employees are enjoying it um, so trying to figure out how to make that work and scott you um part of your courses that you teach and the work you do is you, you physically have traveled to leading companies across Ohio and Northeast Ohio to see not just the future of work from it as we're talking so much remote perspective, but also just the innovation in building. Um, and so you've examined so many diverse sectors, backgrounds. Um, I guess to start, we're, we're to add to what Mike and Carrie have said, um, what are you seeing from some of these contacts that you have at, at these companies and businesses? And then I'm sure we'll get to higher ed in a little bit and, and what kind of the future of that looks like. But yeah. um, at least to start, you know, th this interesting perspective that I'm sure you have of seeing so many sectors and industries and, and companies of all shapes and sizes throughout Northeast Ohio. Sure. So you're, you're right. I mean, the, the course that we were running, it was we were live at a different organization every week. And so uh, I believe, Chris, you attended, maybe we were at Current by GE. Is that the, the mm -hmm. session that you had attended? Yeah, that's, that's great. And so the next three that we were supposed to do were the Federal Reserve, Amazon, their warehouse here in Northeast Ohio, million square foot, and Gojo. And so that, they make Purell. And so those were going to be three fascinating uh, visits, and they were going to be very, very relevant and turned out to be very relevant to what we've experienced the last two or three months, each one of them. And so I have not been in close contact with really any of those companies since that class finished. I think everyone kind of hunkered down, figured out what they needed to do, and they started moving forward. But certainly, so much activity happening in Northeast Ohio, and, and it was a course that really captivated the students. It captivates me every week because I'm not an expert in autonomous vehicles, yet we're at Goodyear and they're talking about some of the innovations they're thinking about. Uh, I'm not an expert in the internet of things, but we're, we're meeting with Gojo, who has incredible functionalities. I mean, they make Purell. And, and they are developing technologies that are helping quality in healthcare facilities. And so fascinating adventure, but one interesting thing to stay on this remote work, I had the CHRO of KeyBank speak in class right before we finished up the semester. And it was really interesting because we did an informal poll. So this is by no means in any way, shape or form scientific, but we asked, our students, and this is juniors in a management major, management and human resources, if they wanted to work from home, how they thought, how they felt about remote work. And literally, I think it was 22 of the 24 said no, they wanted somewhere to go, which actually kind of fascinated me. And as far as an answer, because I, I would have thought that their answer would have been that they would like to have the flexibility. And, and uh, so, so that was just one small kind of data point that surprised both Brian and I, because I think, I think his statistic, and, and this could be a little bit off, but before all of this, I think it was 5% were working remote from KeyBank. And then obviously it's a much, much, much more significant uh, kind of number uh, now. And it'll be fascinating to watch corporate real estate in the coming months, in the coming years. It just will be. And, and that's really that statistic that, that does jump out. And 
I wonder, and perhaps Mike, from your perspective, having, you know, lived it, um, and then carry yours from both recruiting, you know, accomplished professionals, but then also interacting and dealing with uh, placing college, top college talent and students. Do you, do you all think that that's perhaps in some ways generational where when you're young, you want someplace to go to kind of build those in-person connections, learn about a company, but you know, you've done a job for five, 10, 15, 20 years. And at some point, you, you know, you, you don't necessarily need to go to the water cooler in, in order to, and, and you maybe place a premium on not commuting for an hour um, each way, because then you can go to soccer practice at four o'clock and still accomplish everything you need to do. So I guess for all of you may have an interesting perspective on that and I'll throw it out to whoever would like to answer it. But I do wonder if that's partially generational and as, as further you go and the more um, accomplished you are in your career that, it's nice to have that opportunity because you don't need that office space in order to help you get your job done because, you know, you, you just have the experience and the confidence to navigate it to begin with. You know, Chris, I think it's a good point. And I think the danger of talking about this from a generational perspective is it might be a little unfair. And here's why I say that, um, you know, previous generations, they had a style of work that was limited by the technology that they had at their disposal. And us as human beings, we're, we get comfortable in our patterns and the patterns that we establish at a young age, uh, early in our career, and then we're very successful and highly productive within those styles, with that technology we had at our disposal, with those paradigms, whether it be social, whether it be behavioral, whether it be technological, uh, we get comfortable within those norms. And so what I, what I think is happening right now is this pandemic is doing a bit of a forced reset. And the whole generational divide uh, is, is, I think, in some ways eroding a bit. Um, working for a company like Microsoft, we've got a wide range of ages that, you know, work, work there. You know, folks that have worked for the company for 20, 25 years to people that are just out of college. And, you know, what we're finding, at least from a high tech perspective, is some of those norms that you had mentioned uh, that, that people had, you know, held with, with high value, now that they're forced into a situation where they can't do that and they're forced to try out this new way of work, they're actually digging it. They actually like it a lot. Mm. Now, that's not the case for everybody by no stretch of the imagination. And I also don't want to send the signal either that this pure digital interaction is the most optimal either. Here's the reality. Human beings are analog. We're trying to live in a digital world. The majority of our decisions that we make, if you talk to a biologist, not a psychologist, not a behavioral specialist, a biologist, you will find that our decisions don't come from the neocortex where there's logic and language and all that great stuff. It comes from the, the, the reptile brain, the limbic part of our brain where you know, we feel things. And so that's why in these virtual conversations where we're essentially doing the Brady Bunch uh, hour where we're trying to figure out who's talking on all the magic squares, um, why it's so intense for our brains to kind of understand that we are used to seeing those nonverbal cues. So you'll notice with my camera, you know, I'm not just at the headshot. I'm showing half my body. And the reason why is one of the things that we've learned is human beings, how we communicate is not only verbally and through, you know, accentuating certain things in our voice, but it's also the nonverbal cues as well. And that is just so vital in the communication. And that's not going to go away with all this stuff. And so we have to understand that there is going to be some sort of balance here that we've got to figure out where that equilibrium needs to be. Uh, and I don't have the answer to, to that question necessarily. I've obviously I've got tons of opinions about it. Um, but, you know, I think, you know, we can't throw the baby out with the proverbial bathwater here and say that the old methods are wrong. I think there's a lot of great things about the social interaction, but here's what I think is going to happen. I think what's going to happen is once all this stuff starts to lift and we are either semi physically distancing or not physically distancing, people are going to go, hey, for the workloads that I need to be sitting down, concentrating and cranking things out, I'm going to be remote work. For the times that I need to collaborate, I need to innovate, I need to have a sense of camaraderie and teamwork, then we're going to make those physical interactions 
much, much more meaningful than what they are today, which is sporadic, random, ad hoc, et cetera. That's just my crazy thoughts on the topic. Carrie, what, what have you seen with um, the students that, that you know, you, your Venture for America has been placing? Um, what is their perspective on having that opportunity to either go into an office or looking for remote opportunities? And I know part of the mission of Venture for America is uh, to place them physically into cities uh, to help kind of boost up what's going on, you know, in Cleveland and Columbus and Cincinnati, Detroit and other, and other places like that. So what, have, uh, what has that been like and, and what, what do you experience in, in working with so many young talent? Yeah, that's something that we're currently kind of working with and through right now. Um, and it, Scott, you bring up an interesting point where a majority of the students in your class said they, they would want to be in a physical office environment. Um, and I, I do think there's still something important about that. And in part, because in order to be a successful remote employee, I think, you know, you need to be accountable. You need to, there needs to be a really good trust built in between you and whoever your manager is and your colleagues and your peers. Um, I worked remote for Goldman Sachs at one point and there's, there's aspects where like you have to really truly be, you know, trained and know what you're doing in your job and like, and, and also be able to hold yourself responsible um, in order to be a successful remote employee. And sometimes it just takes a couple of years of experience to be able to do that. And that's not to say that someone right out of school couldn't be an incredible remote employee. Many people are doing it today, but there needs to be the mentorship and the resources and the training in place to help them be successful to do that. Um, so as we're looking at it, it's a slightly different situation because at this point, all of our fellows want jobs. They just want to get a job, whether it's remote or whatever city it's in. Um, and we've always kind of said, you know, the job needs to be in, like physically you need to be located in one of our cities. And we're just now starting to have conversations around, hey, if there's a really great growing startup that's in another city that's not a VFA city, but they're open to having that fellow work remote, in one of our VFA cities, like, is that something that we want to consider? Um, and then trying to think through, like, what does that need to look like? And why do we need to make sure? Because something else, like, historically, a lot of times, and, you know, perhaps, Mike, you've seen this at Microsoft, if employees worked remote, sometimes it was just this understanding of, like, well, that's their choice. They're getting a life you know, flexibility of working remote, and that's the path that they choose. If they want career growth and upward trajectory in our company, they need to be in the physical office. That's where like the growth opportunities are. Um, and so if we're going to consider having fellows in companies where they're working remote, we need to make sure those companies are still considering those remote employees for those growth opportunities. So there needs to be a shift in that mentality. But I think there's a balance of just, you know, whether it's in person or not, when you're first starting your, your career, having that mentorship and like guidance and training is so important. And like that can be done virtually, but I, we just need to make sure that we're doing that. So that's kind of like, we're, we're certainly seeing it. And it's also something where like a lot of our companies, while they'll be hiring their fellows um, who would typically start in the next couple of months, like we're not requiring those fellows to move to our, our cities yet. You know, it's, you're going to work remote from wherever you are until it's safe, until you and the company feel that it's appropriate. And yeah. I've even just of like the companies I've talked to, like three of them today, um, half of them have told me, the CEOs have told me they're shifting their model and now they're going to basically be remote first. So it's certainly mm. something we're seeing oh. a lot more of. Um, and so I think there's going to be a huge opportunity for businesses to, and leaders to learn how to build a remote first culture. Hmm. Gary, I wanted to comment real quick uh, on the, uh, the, the, the Microsoft uh, comment. You're, you're, you're spot on. And I'm probably not saying anything confidential that you couldn't find on Google anyways. Um, but uh, it was funny, my first local Ohio Microsoft get together, um, I get introduced into the room and it was, you know, for me, it was a bit kind of embarrassing, but uh, uh, the gentleman introduces me and says, we've got a unicorn here with us tonight. Um, we don't see HQ people here in the field. 
Um, and so, you know, there, there is, has been, and with, it, this is with a lot of companies, this divided not only just physically in the office, but physically at headquarters. And, uh, you know, Microsoft has traditionally been a very age driven company. So sorry, sorry, Scott, uh, I just want to kind of throw in that no. color there. <laughs> no, that's great. That's great. Scott, what if, um, as you've traveled around to, to businesses of all shapes, sizes, sectors, backgrounds, as, as you described, uh, what is the, have many of them previously, pre-corona, adopted work from home remote models or some type of hybrids? Or, because these are all Northeastern Ohio businesses for the most yeah. part, um, or are they, you know, nearly 100% in person? And, and, and as you mentioned, corporate real estate what happens in the five and 10 years and is there a downsizing and some type of hybrid shift model that happens? You know, what's interesting, Chris, is we never even thought to touch on this as a topic, right? I mean, we were literally going to the technology house to talk about uh, additive manufacturing or 3D printing, or we were visiting Goodyear to discuss autonomous vehicles, right? So the, the whole remote workforce wasn't even a, it wasn't on our radar as, as even a topic that we would explore. So it's been, a, I'm sure there are a percentage of folks from at Goodyear who are working remote, but it's not something we ever really even considered discussing, right? I mean, it's kind of fascinating. Yeah, it's been a massive shift and yeah. one that, you know, there was no option other than to immediately do it. And mm -hmm. at least my perspective in talking with businesses all across Ohio is, I think for the first couple of weeks, uh, it was very much a, I'm called almost survival mode in the sense of yeah. people trying to figure out and is the technology even in place? And I was talking with one gentleman at a, at a fairly large company in here in, in Columbus where I'm, where I live. And I asked him when and he said, well, for us and at least my division, it, it went fairly well because uh, someone had, had brought it up in like a town hall uh, about, you know, the possibility and testing it. And so, you know, some senior management were kind of put, put feet to the fire and, and <laughs> testing it out before all of this. And so um, for them, it, it was something that they could do, but a lot of people in their space, it wasn't necessarily that, you know, I mean, who thinks to test, especially for large multinational corporations or fortune 1000 businesses that we're going to turn everyone 95, 99% of people remote with you know the the flip of a switch, and that's a huge. So we're talking about technology, the technology infrastructure to allow that to happen um, is massive. And so, I guess as as we kind of evolve this conversation, and Mike, you had mentioned some of this um, in, in your earlier comments about what is the type of technology that you know that that you all think we might be seeing as we return to work. And, and you had mentioned you know things as simple as doors that open and close by themselves, which a lot of businesses and places have it, but you know, that's reducing the friction of people touching things and kind of spreading germs. Um, so I, I don't know if any of you have come across it or studied or Mike, if, if you mentioned, it, you know, things you've seen or noticed or, or hear that Microsoft is going to employ in order to keep people safe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, um, and the challenge here is that uh, we've got a convergence of, of, of not just one crisis, uh, of, you know, a health crisis, but also we've got a social and behavioral uh, set of, of crisis. We've got an economic crisis and we've got a geopolitical set of crisis. And I definitely don't want to touch on that one. Um, but it's important to understand that these are all forces that are colliding and changing what we perceive as now as the next normal. And, you know, I think that it's important for us to understand kind of, you know, what are some of the top social and behavioral things that are driving the technology first before we go into that. And, you know, I've been doing a lot of work with my colleagues. We've got a COVID-19 task force, uh, but also we're working with um, uh, top folks in academia to understand, you know, behavioral trends, et cetera. And, you know, what we're finding is some really interesting things like, um, yes, we're all remote now, but when we go back, those physical spaces will not be the same again. You know, if it's things as very simple as, you know, how we roll people back into the office and you're not going to see crowded, you know, cube farms uh, anymore. Uh, th there is going to most likely be rotations of people coming in and out. And, you know, are you a Monday, Wednesday person? Are you a Tuesday, Friday person? What, whatever it may be. Um, and, you know, we're going to see this in all aspects of our life, whether it's, you um, 
uh, the office or, you know, McDonald's has already talked about how they are radically changing the, uh, uh, the experience going into their restaurants. Mm. But also, you know, we talked about touchless. Um, you know, we're going to explore more and more of these touchless technologies. I mean, in the chat, uh, there was a conversation around what's the role of AR, VR, and MR, uh, virtual, augmented, and mixed reality. The answer is, is it's been bumped up on the priority list because now instead of touching a manual, uh, why don't I put on a HoloLens and see the manual here in my goggles? Uh, why don't I do the web conference through, again, an augmented reality display, whether it's through a HoloLens, you know, contact lens, which now is, is an emerging trend as well. Um, lots of different things uh, along, along those lines. But also, if you talk to travelers, so like I'm a remote worker and I travel all around the globe. And, you know, th this is very different for me as a remote worker is usually I'm not usually remote in one location. Usually I'm remote in lots of locations. Um, <laughs> you know, close to 20 to 25% of all travelers feel comfortable going to a hotel room or flying. Only 20 to 25%. Now you've got edge cases in France where 40% of them feel comfortable, in India close to 50%. Uh, but for most of the world, people do not feel comfortable and they want guarantees. And the standard mm -hmm. now, as far as cleanliness, has now went sky high. So when we look at our workplaces, um, you know, just like with airlines, Delta just announced a chief cleanliness officer that will be aboard each plane. Well, now, are, will, will we see this in the office? I guarantee you, we most certainly will. Mm. Um, but also understanding that our workforce may look very different. Um, you know, we, we, we've seen a gig economy out there before. But now with all the furloughs and reductions of force, et cetera, now we're seeing an emergence of the gig worker economy. And if you listen to folks like uh, uh, Gartner, they actually have said you know, fairly aggressively that 23% uh, of, organiz uh, of organizations, 23% of their workforce will be gig workers over the next couple of years. That's huge, right? And so yeah. uh, to kind of cap it off, because there's lots of other things going on, um, I think the other big aspect is, uh, from a technology perspective, is the programs around digital transformation that were either kind of lingering in the background and didn't get either enough priority or they were kind of viewed as very futuristic. Those now, you know, what I see with my my customers is those those projects are rapidly accelerating. And if you look at um, an area, you know, like pharma, you know, they've had a supply chain that has been rampant with fraud, um, you know, very brittle and fragile as far as from a global perspective, you know, $200 billion in counterfeit drugs every year. That's, that's a very lucrative industry for bad guys. Um, mm. But not only that, now we've got what, 7.3, 7.4 billion people on this planet that need a vaccine and a booster and a Band-Aid and disinfectant wipes and doctors and nurses and cold storage facilities. You know, these digital transformation projects will be required for so many things in our global supply chain to make it uh, as robust as it needs to be to support that next normal. And, oh, Carrie, and, and you spend, or go ahead, Scott, please. No, I, I was, I was just going to say another technology that I think we'll see emerging is voice. And, and so, uh, you know, Andrew Yang talks about some of these roles that are, are ripe for, for automation, whether that's trucking or whether that's a, a sales associate and, you know, Amazon has the Amazon Go stores that they're beta testing where I can literally walk in and not have to touch anything except for the product and then walk out. And, and so I, it's going to be really interesting to watch not only, like I said, real estate, but it's going to be interesting and fascinating to watch how many of these roles are, continue to be automated, at a, to, to, to Mike's point, to, uh, how many of these roles continue to be automated at, at a pretty rapid pace. And so... Um, I know, Carrie, you're on the forefront of all of this, placing people in some of these firms. Um, 
I think the role of automation is just going to continue and, and touchless voice is going to continue to play a major factor. Carrie, um, one of the things is, is that it's been interesting and we were talking about kind of this, this shift and maybe it's a hybrid. Um, but I know a lot of people in, in smaller companies, remote workers also, um, will use things like co-working facilities, which we work was in the headlines plenty even before all of this. But I guess by definition, that, that is something that I think traditionally smaller companies, people that work remotely from home, will take advantage of, even if it was a couple of days a week to get that human element. Um, but as we think things about cleanliness and kind of sharing common spaces, uh, what what does that future look like? Because I know a lot of your startups and you and I have even met at, at co-working facilities too. Um, wh wh where do you think that trend kind of takes us in, in the coming months and years? Yeah, it's interesting. I think there's a couple different directions it could go. Um, mm -hmm. One, for a while at least, you know, the whole concept of sharing a open table with someone you don't know who's less than six feet away from you probably won't be acceptable or people won't be comfortable with it. So I think with co-working space, there might be a lot more interest and demand for private office spaces within those co-working facilities. Um, but what I also see potentially happening is an opportunity for some of your companies who don't, and it doesn't make sense to make an investment in bigger real estate for your entire company, but then to actually just use co-working space for when you have some of your team that needs a place to get together, they can go to that co-working space that already has all the amenities and certain things covered. So you don't have to worry about those costs. So, you know, I think the, the model will certainly shift for the co-working space. Um, it, I don't necessarily see them going away because I don't see people um, as many organizations still making this investment in corporate real estate and like having a headquarter, at least not until like you're a much larger company. Um, that whole concept of a headquarter might also play a different role. And I think Mike, you talked a little bit about this too, like headquarters could be a, a strategy for recruitment. It could be a strategy for, you know, being more thoughtful about how you have collaboration with your company and how you bring your employees together versus the place where your employees work every single day. Um, but I still think that there's probably going to be a need for people to have a place to go to do work. I just think the standard and the space layout is going to change in those co-working spots. And, and Scott, um, from a university perspective, which is an industry very much built on in-person gathering and students literally live together and you go to class together and, you know, it's a campus. Um, what, what is, what are those changes? And, and I guess, you know, the future of higher ed is, is a whole different conversation, but at least yeah. in, you know, the, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the short term or, or maybe next calendar year um, to, you know, because uh, for any, you know, a lot of us, myself included, college was among the best four years of my life and we're a lot ton yeah. of my friends. And it's because you're physically with people and you can't recreate yeah. that over. I mean, we would rather be in, in person together today. Um, yeah. But at the same time, we're in different cities and we're in different locations. So what, yeah. what is that university is in some ways, this is hitting universities in higher ed, perhaps as hard or harder than than nearly every other industry because of that reliance on in-person and physical presence. Yeah. So, so how does this play out this fall? Okay. I mean, obviously we have a bunch of data that's going to come in just in the next few weeks based on what people were doing over Memorial day and how some of the face mask and um, social distancing, how that's working and all of that. And so I think, a lot of it, it's in flux, at least for my institution. My, my institution has said that we're going to be using a, a system called HiFlex, which is a hybrid flexible model. So we might have a situation where I have 10 people actually in the room, seven people on a monitor. Maybe as a faculty member, I might be there. Maybe I might not be a faculty member who feels comfortable putting themselves in a situation where they're, you know, maybe they're, they have a, a, a a condition that might not allow them to feel comfortable in that way. So uh, institutions of higher education want to say we're coming back because that drives uh, attendance, that drives any number of different elements 
from an institutional perspective, but I, I, I don't know. I'm planning for my classes to be online. If I, we need to switch that that's going to be face to face, I'm good. I can switch back to that really easily. I, it's more difficult for me to provide a transformational, a really quality, solid learning experience if I'm trying to switch that on the fly, like I did this spring, you know, it was March 8th or 10th or whatever that was. And I'm literally hunkered down in my bedroom kind of with a computer on my knee teaching. Uh, I have, I have some more time to plan for that now. And, and it's been kind of an interesting puzzle. How do I create a transformational learning experience online and, and do just a good, just as good a job, if not better. Now I might not be able to, but that's the puzzle I'm going to work. So for instance, Chris, when we went to online and we no longer were going to be with Gojo in person, you know, I reached out to a friend of mine who's at Zillow and does machine learning for Zillow. And, and he, he zoomed in and we had an incredible conversation with him. That's something we couldn't have done necessarily in the previous iteration of the course. So I think there's some opportunity. I really do. I think there's some opportunity to figure this out. Um, I think what it looks like moving forward, it, I think we need to wait for the summer and see how that shakes out. But I think also it's going to be some hybrid model where I don't expect everyone will be in the same room. And, and then to the degree to which, you know, people have face masks on and we're trying to have conversations six feet away from each other, it's going to be really interesting to watch it unfold. Um, you know, we, we have this digital disruption that's occurring and we have this biological disruption that's occurring and, and both of them are going to hit us pretty hard. You know, Scott, I, I really love what you said there around uh, it's a balance, mm -hmm. you know, hybrid models. You know, there isn't going to be a sharp answer one way or another. Um, you know, this is likewise with, you know, the technology question that you asked, uh, Chris, which is, you know, there's not going to be any one given technology that's going to be the silver bullet. You know, uh, you know, for the, you know, the macro point that we're trying to enable here with our workplaces, with our universities, you know, retailers, et cetera, it's all about fr frictionless, it's all about touchless technologies. And that's going to be a combination of, you know, near field communications, you know, beacons, mobility, wearables, AI, you know, uh, facial recognition, gesture recognition, a lot of different technologies that are going to have yeah. to be employed in new and meaningful ways. And with that, we're going to be posed with some questions that we haven't had before. Uh, we're going to have questions around ethics and, you know, what are we allowed to capture? What are we allowed to use? In what circumstances is it okay? In what circumstances is it, isn't it okay? How do we guarantee that there's not bias that's baked into these algorithms? And I'm not going to go through all the examples because we probably have heard about a lot of these different examples of where, you know, not intentionally, but unintentionally, you know, bad things can happen uh, because at the end of the day, people are the ones that are building and training these AI algorithms. And so I think ethical AI is going to be a, a big thing here and, and around the data as well around how we manage this data. We see this with Apple and Google today, even Microsoft with a partnership with uh, UW uh, around, um, you know, uh, the contact tracing. You know, some could view that as a violation of my civil liberties. Is that okay or not? Right. Uh, you know, these are going to be big questions that we can't answer here, but are going to be broader societal questions that we're going to have to answer. You know, but also we're, also, when we go into these spaces, these spaces are going to be reimagined. So not only is it going to be AR, VR technology, but these spaces are going to be tailorable and configurable. So when I mentioned the Microsoft campus, we before the pandemic, we actually knocked down a great number of buildings in uh, our main campus in Redmond. And our whole goal wasn't to build a space uh, 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 saucer. <laughs> it wasn't to build a biodome like Amazon or anything like that. Our goal was to create a smart campus. And if I was an individual with certain preferences, you know, the campus would adapt to me instead of me adapt to the campus. And one interesting use case was around travel. You know, why do I have to take my luggage to the airport to get checked by the security folks? Uh, to then be handled by the airlines, then to be picked up at customs and rechecked again, 
to then getting it and then wheeling it over to a cab to a hotel, then finally unpacking. There's a lot of steps there. There's a lot of friction there. What if I just left my suitcase in front of my office and all my itinerary, all that stuff was, they knew that I was going to be in London next week and my suitcase just showed up in my hotel room. You know, didn't have to deal with any of that stuff. That's the, the level of sophistication that you're going to find. You know, this is probably an edge example of the most extreme angle, but you're definitely going to see that our spaces, you know, there's going to be more and more sensor technology uh, in our seats and our whiteboards and the environment from, you know, simple things like temperature from a facilities management perspective, but lighting, uh, maybe even social distancing preferences, lots of different things that are going to be uh, adapted into these smart spaces. And and one thing is, is we talk about um, <clears throat> the transition of, of, you know, to remote work or at least this hybrid model, something like Facebook, where it might be 50-50 in five or 10 years. Um, th that 50% that might be in San Francisco or Silicon Valley or Seattle, Microsoft or in New York City, carry your former colleagues uh, in, in, in Manhattan. They have to go somewhere and they have to move somewhere. So I would say, we'll start with you, Carrie. Are there, are you seeing some of your former contacts or colleagues starting to look at potential opportunities outside of New York City because they want to leave, whether that's the potential opportunity to stay in their current job and work remote, or perhaps this has been the catalyst to get them to start, you know, job hunting for maybe a position in a place like Cleveland or, or Cincinnati or somewhere else. I feel like before the pandemic, there has been a shift and a trend where people are starting to look for jobs outside of Silicon Valley and New York City because of, again, what Zuckerberg was saying, you know, one of the number one reasons why people are leaving the company is because they want to live in a place, be closer to family. Like the cost of rent is crazy in those cities for you to live in a shoebox. Um, just the quality of life is very different. And for some people, it doesn't matter because they're never at their apartment and your lifestyle is very, very different or you make a significant amount of money. And so you can have multiple homes and, and live that life. But um, even before this was happening, have been seeing a shift where people are looking either the, the big thing is um, either they're working, trying to find a way for their current employer to allow them to work remote and, and move to another city um, and definitely seeing more employers being comfortable with that and realizing like this is a good person who's contributing and adding value to our company. We don't want to lose them just because they're not physically in the space. Um, actually also even seeing that in Cleveland with some of our company partners who have really talented individuals who life is calling them somewhere else and they're saying hey you know what okay go move there you're still working for us you're still adding value to our company so i think that trend was already starting to happen the big thing is at least for us in like some cities like cleveland is making sure that there are the job opportunities exist to attract those individuals and it's they're not just moving for a job but they're moving for a career um, but one of the big things i saw at my previous company when I was recruiting for a startup in Cleveland was it became really hard to recruit some talent, particularly technical talent, um, who were working remote for Seattle, San Francisco based companies getting paid really good dollars and, and had this great quality of life. For them, it's like, why am I gonna take a pay cut, add an hour and a half commute to my schedule when I'm at home and working great. So I think this this trend was already happening um, before before this happened, and I think the pandemic is just now forcing companies to be more proactive in how they think about it. So, Carrie, I, I think you're, you're you're right, and you know I'll add. A, I'm looking for a job angle uh, from from my perspective as already employed by a company and having the flexibility of living anywhere. And, you know, I, I could choose to, I, I lived in Seattle for a number of years. I, I love the city of Seattle. I've got lots of friends there. There's great things to do, all that great stuff. I've lived in LA, you know, lots of different places. But I think some of the things that you're talking about uh, resonate for people that already work for a Microsoft and Amazon, a Google and Apple, et cetera, is that, what this is forcing them to think about that they hadn't thought about necessarily before they thought about it in passing or they're on a conference call with me and I'm like, Hey guys, 
uh, you're paying, you know, I'm paying half the price and quadruple the square footage. Uh, you know, how's life in Seattle today, right? Um, but now they're like, hey, I'm doing this remote thing and it's not as vital for me to physically be in this city. And so what we're seeing as a trend, you know, with high tech people that are already employed is questioning, well, can I really take this to the next level and move back home or go to an area of the country where, you know, it is more affordable uh, and have a better quality of life uh, with my family. And so I think that's going to be another aspect. And if these high tech companies want to retain their employees, they need to provide flexible options for people to be able to do that. Or they're gonna and that's a great segue, Mike. We just got a really good question mm -hmm. in from Nicole. So thank you, Nicole. Um, but we're talking about remote work and, and, and working from home, which uh, one of the big elephants in the room throughout this process has been, you know, for families, for uh, parents that have children. And, and, uh, and we've, I'm sure we've all seen kind of the, the meme that there's two pandemics or shelters in places, one for those with kids and then those for ones without kids, because as things like daycare have been shut down. And, and so as businesses, whether it's a full, you know, Twitter remote first, and they have a ton of a high percentage or these hybrid models and approaches, or maybe even as Mike, you said earlier, you're on the Tuesday, Thursday um, schedule where you only come to the office two days a week and you work from home the other three. What do you think businesses will do, companies, um, as part of perhaps compensation packages or just perks to recruit talent um, and do things like uh, uh, corporate subsidies for on-demand, part-time child care, family care, those types of things that, um, you know, ha have now kind of, it, it's been shifted around so much. And, and I'll, I'll throw that out to, to anyone, but some of these things that it's been forcing us to think about this, um, you know, that, that we weren't necessarily experiencing before this pandemic and, and the realities of especially those with children. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start with this one too. So I think this pandemic has um, increased the level of empathy that so many of us have. Um, the amount of times I have been on a phone call or a video call um, and I've had my daughter, you know, crying in the background or doing whatever. <laughs> um, and, and just people understand because they're going through the same thing. Um, and also people just understanding how hard it is to parent and work. And that's, you know, I think there is, to answer your question, Nicole, I absolutely see this, there being a shift um, where companies are going to start thinking differently about what does the benefit package look like that you're offering to your employees. Um, and some of that might include different types of stipends, stipends that could be around professional development. I mean, some of these already exist, obviously, but stipends around um, child support, um, services around child support. Um, I, I could absolutely see that there could even be more flexibility in figuring out what are those working schedules. Um, I know even in our company, we've kind of just created some ways to communicate with each other to let people know if you're offline or not. You know, you either put a do not schedule on your calendar if you're taking your child to the doctor's office or on Slack, you have a note that says, hey, I'm out for the next two hours, but then I'll be back online. And so there's ways where already that culture is shifting to have that level of flexibility. Um, I think it will only continue to get more fully fleshed out, um, particularly as, you know, people now have this, I think, increased level of empathy to understand what it's like to parent and work. Um, and the needs to be able to provide that level of flexibility and support. Yeah, I think you're right, Carrie. And, you know, I, I definitely see it um, uh, from the Microsoft side uh, as well. And, and friends that I talk to working for other high tech firms and uh, even non high tech firms is that uh, there, there's two sides of the equation. There's one side, uh, the, the empathy side. And, you know, the, the things that I can talk about that I, you know, have firsthand knowledge of is, you know, at Microsoft, uh, we've actually got AI technology that we get an email that gets sent to us every morning that talks about productivity, you know, how much we're working on email and all that stuff. And so we had that pre-pandemic, but now it's super relevant post as we're going through this, that now our executive team has actually told their employees, you guys are working crazy amount of hours. It's mandatory that you take this next Thursday and Friday off. That happened last, last week for certain areas of the organization. You see those rotations. 
where, you know, myself personally, the past two months, 13, 14 hour days, people are getting emails from me at one in the morning, you know, you, because that work-life balance is starting to blend together and it impacts these other areas of our life. And so, like you said, Carrie, you know, that empathy component, if I go to my boss and say, hey, you know, listen, I got to take a break. I got to take a half day. I got to go dip in the pool, hang out there with the family, you know, for a little while. Uh, they're going to look at that differently than how they looked at that pre-pandemic. But also as far as the hard benefits, you know, companies are looking at what they can do. You know, Microsoft had adjusted their benefits. Essentially, um, I forget what the actual uh, number of weeks it was, but I think it was somewhere around six weeks. Uh, Microsoft was giving an additional six weeks of vacation uh, to employees because of the child care issue, um, uh, which is substantial, right? Um, but also looking at, since we were already a digital first company, a lot of our training was already online. A lot of these, uh, you know, services were already available, but it was more about, hey, let's make sure people leverage those and using our technology to identify that and proactively help people because we kind of get in this psychological mode where we're like, especially folks that aren't used to working remotely, they think, oh crap, if, I, if it doesn't look like I'm working really hard, my boss isn't gonna think that I'm working. And so it's this vicious cycle. And you know, I think to that empathy thing again, which is so, so darn important, is you know, those leaders that take a proactive stance on looking at their employees, what they're doing, looking at that work-life balance, they're going to be much more successful than the ones that maybe take advantage of it. I think we're going to move to, you know, in this virtual, the virtual leader, quote unquote, uh, Mike and, and Carrie, I'm sure the two of you have metrics you're shooting for, or at least you're, you have smart goals. We could, we could call them. We could uh, productivity markers, whatever they are. Uh, I, I, I'm, I think we're moving more and more towards that space. I was up at 5.30 this morning. My most productive time right now is 5.30 to 8. Why? No one's awake. And so I'm plowing like a madman. And I'm also working tonight from 6.30 to 8.30. But I took a walk at 2 <laughs> before the session, right? And, and I have certain benchmarks I have to hit. Now, whether they're hit between 8 and 5, it's just so, it's so blurred. And um, I, think, I think it's gonna move to more of that space. Are you hitting your, your productivity numbers? If not, why? Let's have a conversation. Um, but it's, it's gonna be fascinating to watch it play out. It just really is. And, and of course, every industry is a little bit different. Yeah, and I yeah. feel like we've seen this earlier, um, sorry, Chris, with just like software engineering, where for a while, software engineers yeah. have been working, they work better at night. You know, like that yep. doesn't mean they're going to stay in the office until out. two Who cares when you do it? <laughs> and then they're going to be the ones that walk into the office at like 11 a.m., yeah, 1 no. p.m. But like they're still getting their work done. So like yeah, I, that was yeah. already existing for for like a small group of people. But I think we're now going to start to see that to your point, um, that yeah. schedule changing. Yeah. It, it's it's just a very clear, here's the, here's the benchmark. I don't care when you do it, knock it out. And um and again, of course, depending on the industry, that, that looks different. And I think that's a, so we're approaching one hour. So thank you for everyone who's uh, been on and, the, and the, the different people that have sent in chat questions. Um, and, and I've really enjoyed this conversation. So perhaps to, to end, we'll do a quick around the horn. Uh, I can start with you, Scott. But what's one prediction um, we'll go Scott, Mike, and then Carrie, if you want to uh, wrap it up. And it can just be a prediction on the future of work, which is obviously, as we've talked about it today, it's a big topic. Um, you know, six months ago, the future of work was probably not around uh, virtual remote teams. It was probably around how technology is impacting it. So a prediction that can fit to whatever your definition is um, that we can expect to see in the coming months and years. Uh, so Scott, do you want to uh, kind of offer up something fun to end. Sure, sure. So as an educator, my, my passion right now is how do we help young men and women who are not technologists, they weren't at Case Western Reserve or they weren't in engineering at Ohio State, how do we help them develop a digital mindset and develop some level of tech literacy so that they are moving into the work the work, uh, their working life with, with that on their radar so that they can stay on the cutting edge of all of this 
uh, versus the chopping block, so to speak. And so that's, that's a passion for mine right now. I don't have a background in technology. I don't have a background in the future of work. <laughs> that's, that's not what I studied, but I'm passionate about it. And I want our, our students to have their eyes wide open as they kind of enter the workforce. So that's something that's, that, that I have a passion for is, is how do we stay relevant and on the cutting edge? And I think institutions of higher education are gonna have to rethink how we're preparing students for that because I don't know that we're there yet. Mike? Yeah, so I've got one answer, two parts. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yelling the hell out of this one. Um, so this, uh, this centers around people interaction. I think that over the next two to three years that we're going to see a, I want to be controversial. I think we're going to see a 50% reduction in the amount of meetings that we have. And this is in time. So typically an hour meeting, now that's 30 minutes, maybe that's 15 minutes. So I think half of those meetings are gonna be significantly reduced. And then I think that of those meetings, 60 to 70% of those meetings are going to be virtual instead of physical. We're not gonna eliminate physical meetings, but there's gonna be a lot of meetings that we won't need to have in person because we're just way more productive uh, in some cases when we're not in person. So I think, Half of uh, our meetings will be significantly reduced, and I think 60 to 70 percent uh, of those meetings will be purely virtual over the next two to three years. Harry? Awesome. Um, so probably nothing that like we haven't talked about today, but I just in general see having more like distributed global teams um, is going to be more common because there is going to be the ability to work remote um, and people are going to be able to live in different places. They're going to be able to travel more easily to the extent that becomes comfortable and normal again. But um, I do think there's, it's going to be a lot more common that people are attached to like their employees, like the people themselves and their careers versus like the physical company and that experience. Great. Well, thank you all, Scott, Mike, Kerry, uh, for being on today and everyone who tuned in. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation and hope everyone in attendance did as well. Uh, we'll be having more of these on a whole host and range of topics. So uh, you can always go to ohiox.org, specifically ohiox.org slash events uh, for more like these in the coming weeks and months as we explore different topics around technology innovation, uh, what the future looks like. And so uh, thank you again to our panelists, most importantly, uh, for taking the time to share your work and your insight. And uh, I really appreciated it. And, and, I, and I hope everyone else uh, enjoyed it as well. So thank you, everyone. And uh, we certainly appreciate you all being here today. So thank you very much. Thanks for having us, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Bye-bye.